click on this computer. So we're very happy to have once more uh, Jean-Luc with us. Uh, unfortunately, the last lecture of this mini course, but I'm sure this nucleate many, as I say, already we has a project or many more questions to come. So this will, is, is, a, is a seed uh, mini course. Uh, so please, Jean-Luc, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so this is the fourth and final lecture. Um, so where we left off last time was looking at the action of the braid group on the fundamental group of a surface. This is the so-called R10 representation of the braid group. Um, so remember that sigma i was an operation that we defined where you have a punctured disk and sigma i is the clockwise interchange by 180 degrees of two adjacent punctures, the i and i plus one puncture. And what I showed last time is that you could define an action on the elements of pi one or the generators of pi one, and pi one being the space of loops based at a particular point in the punctured disk. So here I'm drawing the disk with three punctures, and there are three loops around the three punctures. And we saw that you could by just pivoting these punctures, you're dragging the loops along, and then by kind of retracting the loops properly to x0, you can see that you're actually acting on the generator EI with sigma i, so I write that action as sigma i star, by conjugation, meaning that you pre and post multiply by EI and EI inverse, where EI plus one is in the middle, and the i plus one element just gets switched to e i. Clockwise, you're sliding e two underneath e one. Okay, and then all of the other loops get left alone by sigma i. So much like for the braid group relations, for the braid relations themselves, the action on the fundamental group only involves kind of two adjacent loops and none of the other loops. So it's very local. Um, and remember that these are elements of the fundamental group, sorry, of the free group on um, N symbols, meaning there are N punctures here. So this is the N, the N puncture disk. It is, it's, its fundamental group is generated by N loops, which I write E1 to EN. And these, in this case, form a free group, meaning that the symbols EI obey no particular relations other than group properties, basic group properties. In particular, they don't commute. So this is a, a nice construction. It allows you to compute things like growth in this group. Okay, so we've kind of switched the viewpoint from a geometric viewpoint or a topological viewpoint where we look at growth of loops at their length to now looking at combinatorial problems of looking at the growth of symbols in a sequence because the number of symbols that you see here is exactly going to be related to the length of these curves. So if we could estimate the rate of growth of um, the length of this word, so the number of free group generators that there is in this particular word under repeated iterations of my full braid, meaning some combination of sigmas that are multiplied together, then we would be able to estimate the efficiency of a taffy polar in some sense. Like how rapidly will the piece of taffy grow under repeated iteration? But I told you last time that part of the problem with this is that in practice, it isn't a very good mathematical, a very good practical approach. And that's because the number of symbols here will grow extraordinarily rapidly. Very, very rapidly, you will actually max out the memory of your computer if you try to compute the action on this, these symbols for just a few iterations, it becomes extremely rapidly. Also, when you apply the next sigma, it has to act on every single generator. So the whole nested process becomes prohibitively costly. So we would be after something a little bit more, um, you know, tractable that would scale better with large numbers of punctures and very long braids. And so there is this process that I mentioned, which is passing from the fundamental group of a surface, pi one, to the homology group of a surface, 
H1, the first homology group. And that process is called abelianization. And abelianization is completely simple-minded. It just says, I'm just going to forget that this is a free group. I'm going to assume that every group element commutes. And what you do then is you write this group additively, meaning that instead of multiplying symbols together, you add and subtract because you know the intuition is that addition and subtraction are, uh, or addition is commutative. So in other words, the sequence EI, EI plus one, EI inverse in pi one becomes, here I like to write capital letters for some reason when thinking of the homology element, becomes EI plus EI plus one minus EI when I pass the H1. So all I've done is I've written the products here as addition, except that there's an inverse that's like having a minus sign because it's the additive inverse. And so just symbolically then, these things cancel. And then left that the image of my loop EI is just EI plus one. So I have, in other words, that EI goes to EI plus one, and EI plus one goes to EI. Which is just saying that the generator that interchange two punctures also simply interchange two loops. So that's basically the symmetric or the, the permutation group in action. So in this abelianization, we have transformed this free group representation of the ray group, so this action on a free group, into an action on a billion group, but we've lost too much because all we're doing now is shuffling the punctures. We've totally forgotten that there were any loops involved in some sense. So if you imagine acting with a braid many, many, many times, all you'll find out at the end of the day is which puncture went where, but nothing, no information about the loops whatsoever. So this is too dramatic. This process of billionization, it lost way too much information about the group. So what I hinted at at the end of the previous lecture is that maybe there was a way to retain a bit more information than this, but still go in the billion set. Okay, great. Feel free to interrupt, by the way, if there are any questions along the way. Okay, so I'm going to do this now. Okay, so let's erase this abelianization since it wasn't so useful in the end. And let's try to think of what's called a covering space instead. So a covering space, I'm not going to define things very precisely here, but the idea of a covering space is that you will make many copies of your domain, but in a way that you maintain some notion of continuity across the copies. So if you've done any kind of undergraduate mathematics at all, one of the simplest examples of a covering space is when you do branch cuts in complex analysis. So in complex analysis, you may be taking the square root and you, you have trouble maintaining continuity of the square root if you cross this line. And so you say, well, I'm just gonna declare that if I ever cross the negative real axis, I'm now on a new Riemann sheet. Right? So it's an entirely new copy of the complex plane. And I maintain continuity by saying that this cut here doesn't take you to the same plane, but if you ever cross this, it's like a staircase and you go up one copy of the plane and now you're on a new plane. Okay, So if you think of a spiral on the complex plane, every time you go around the origin, you're going up a floor in a tall building. Okay? That's a covering space, meaning that I've just covered the original plane with several copies of itself, but I've maintained continuity across these cuts. I can do the same for my disk. Here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make these cuts like this. I'm gonna make three cuts between my punctures, one, two, three, and my boundary. So there 
there's a way to draw this. The picture is kind of hard to draw, and I don't think I can manage to make a good example, but let me just try to get the flavor across by drawing a very simple diagram. So these are two copies of my domain. So now let me consider my loop E1. So my loop E1, as you see here, it starts from X0 and it goes towards my branch cut. And it does this, right? Okay. But now the idea behind the branch cut is that when I emerge on the other side, I won't be in my original copy of the disk anymore. I will emerge on this side. So let me label the copies. I'm going to call this T to the power of zero. T is going to be an index. It's just a symbol. T will count which copy I'm on. And so this is T and this is T1. Okay. So my loop, in other words, um, would now be attached to a point here. So this is the point x0. So you might think, oh, I've just made a loop again. But the difference is that this is no longer the point x0. It's the point x0 upstairs on the second floor of the building. So again, think of it this way, right? Before I was making a loop in my living room and I was going back to where I started. Now I start the same loop, but I go up the stairs and I end up in the bedroom on the second floor. And I finish on a point directly above the living room. And that point I'm going to call TX0. So TX0 is the translation of the point X0 to one floor above. Okay. So my loop is actually no longer a loop because it's not closed. It's actually an arc now, just a, a curve on the surface. Okay, so again, the loop E1 started from X0, crossed the branch cut, which means now it's on the second floor and goes to a point TX0. So if I want to visualize it in three dimensions, my loop when I would go something like this, right? It would go up and then catch up at some point TX0 which is kind of upstairs on the second floor. But now let's say I go, I want to go through the loop again. Okay, maybe I'll change colors. So let's say I want to go around the loop twice, but I need to maintain continuity. I'm not allowed to just, when I get to the branch cut, I can only go up or down a floor. I can't go up or down two floors. So if I pursue my loop here, So it looks like I'm closing the loop, except that I'm getting to the branch cut again. And that tells me I need to invoke a new copy of my space, of my punctured disk. And my brown segment now will emerge on the second floor of the building. So I'm gonna number the floors British style since I'm in Britain. So there's the ground floor, then there's the first floor. Maybe I, sense, I said second floor earlier, I'm not sure. But then there's the second floor. And I'm gonna label the second floor as T squared. Okay. So what I've drawn in drawing two copies of this loop is not a loop at all, but it's a spiral. That now goes up to the second floor. But if I project it down, if I flatten it again, let's say there's an earthquake and my house collapses, all of the loops will collapse onto each other because they all sit above each other. They all sit above the original copy. If I, if I had glass floors, I can see exactly the loop underneath me and I can map them all down. I can squash them all back down to the, to the original domain. So there's a well-defined projection of the copies of the covering space back to the base space that it covers. It's a, it's a very interesting construction. 
And there's many ways to do these covering spaces. And what I'm choosing to do here is a particular type of cover where if I now consider a second loop like this, it actually goes to the same second floor or first floor, sorry. In other words, I could choose to branch at each cut in a way that it takes me to a completely new copy. That's a type of cover. Or I can choose to branch at each cut in a way that all of these cuts leads to the same second floor. So I'm choosing to do this in a way that all of these three, all three branch cuts actually share a first floor, share a second floor, et cetera. Okay. So maintaining continuity means that now I merge here. By the way, if I were to double back and turn around and cross the branch cut again, going the, up, going the same way that I just came, by continuity, I would have to emerge back on the zeroed floor. Everything has to be continuous. In the covering space, all these curves are perfectly continuous curves. They never jump uh, drastically from one floor to another. There are staircases, and if you come out of a staircase and you decide to turn around, you need to come back down the same staircase. You can't just jump, jump down to the ground. So all this construction is beautifully continuous, and it basically maps um, loops into arcs. Okay. So all of the arcs will be go from, from x0 to tx0, say, or from tx0 to t squared x0 would represent a loop that has been lifted um, twice, right? That has been, that now lives the second time. Okay. And I can go the other way as well. So if I took instead my loop and I went this way, if I cross the branch cut the other way, then I go into the basement, right? So I need to draw yet another copy. I'm running out of space, but I guess I'll need to erase eventually. So I draw one more copy. And this curve that I drew here emerges there, going this way, and maybe going back down to x0. But it's not x0, it would be called the inverse x0. Okay, so I get positive powers of t and I get ne negative powers of t depending on whether I'm going up above ground or below to the basement. Okay. There's a few more choices I need to make. For instance, is this building infinitely tall, right? Let's assume it is for now, meaning I can keep going up and up and up, and also this building as an infinitely deep basement, meaning I can keep going down and down and down. But you're perfectly allowed to truncate this construction by saying that eventually t to the n, you know, catches up with t to the minus n, say, that there is a, a value for which you get back to where you started is perfectly you're allowed to do that as well. That, that would give you a finite cover, meaning there's only, there will only be a finite number of copies uh, of the disk. In particular, you could choose t to be such that t squared is t zero, in which case you would only have two copies. And that's called a double cover. These are all abstract constructions, so it doesn't matter what t is in a way, but it's just a symbol and you just define it as being a cyclic group meaning that T squared is the identity, which means that this would be a building. It would be a strange building, right? It would mean you would start from the ground floor, you go up one floor, and then you go up one more floor and you find that you're back on the ground floor. But for argument's sake now, let's just keep our construction such that the building is infinitely tall and infinitely deep. Okay. Are there... Any questions at this point before I continue with how I'm going to actually use this construction? So far, no. Everything is perfect. <laughs> okay. All right. So, let's look at the image of our loops under the sigmas. 
We had before that sigma i star on EI was EI, EI plus one, EI inverse. Okay. Let's look at this in terms of our covering space. So I start again. I draw my branch cuts. And let's just try to write down this loop. Think of this as E1, E2, E1 for completeness sake. But now E1 looks like this, right? I go like this. And then I'm on the second floor. So let me draw a second floor. Sorry, I keep saying second floor, but first floor by the British standards. I'm not sure how Brazil numbers its floors, whether you have the ground floor and then the first floor or the first floor and the second floor like in the United States, but let's just skip the zero, one, two, just to keep things concrete. So this is E1. It's actually the lift of E1, but I'm, I don't want to introduce too much notation. So then it comes out on the other copy and it goes back to X0, right? Because it's a closed loop. Well, okay, it's not quite X0, right? It's TX0. It's the translation of X0 to the second floor, okay? But then I follow this by an E2. Okay, well, an E2 is like coming like this, and then again, meeting the branch cut. Maybe I should draw this picture a little bit more clearly. Sorry, I've, I didn't leave myself very much space. Let's close the loop this way, and then do E2. So again, I'm doing E1, but I have to hit the branch cut, so I get to the copy of the, get the second floor. Then I do an E2, so I have to start on the second floor, right? Or I'm sorry, on the first floor. By continuity, I, I have to restart from where I ended. These loops are chained together, so they become arcs that are chained together. Okay. So now I, have, I make it to a third floor. Okay, I come out of this loop and I go back here. Okay. So I make it all the way to the point T squared X zero. All right, I'm almost done. I've done E1, E2, to finish my construction, I just need to do E1 inverse again. But remember, we have to do this whole process sort of continuously. So I have to start from my final point here, which is T squared X zero. And now I'm gonna do E1 inverse. So I start from here. And I, had, I do an, uh, an E1 loop, but going the opposite direction. But notice that this takes me back down to the first floor. So I come out here, this is not necessarily tied to this point, but about here. So my loop went up, up, then back down by one, okay. which is really the total sum of the signs, right? Plus one, plus one, minus one, is then went up, up, and down. Okay, so my arc does something a little bit more complicated than just the loops. But my point is simply that because, because the image has to be continuous, it is uniquely defined how you're going to lift this to the cover. Okay, you have to follow each of these arcs in the way, and, and you know, starting from the correct floor so that they link together. Again, please interrupt me if, uh, if, if this is confusing. I'm going to erase this picture in a second. So, the key is now this. I have just defined a new type of action of the break group sigma, oh, sorry, of the generators of the break group sigma i. Before I had an action on the fundamental group pi one of the disk, but now I have an, another action on arcs on this covering space. 
it's in a way a bigger action, right? I've inflated, I've inflated the space of things that I'm looking at because there's more, there's more possibilities for these arcs here. So I can think of my action now as being something like EI followed by say TEI plus one to represent the fact that I'm already one copy above and then T squared EI inverse to represent the fact that I'm even one more copy above, okay? So instead of writing EI, let me write T to the N I. So this is the loop and this is the arc. This is which copy of the floor it lives on, right? I'm labeling a copy of the floor that it lives on with some power. So why am I doing all this? Well, because now again, I'm gonna write my action in the following way. So this, this lifted action, I'm gonna write a sigma i star acting on e i. Okay, in the notes, I have tildes over these things to represent the fact that they're on the covering space, but I'm not gonna bother with this notation on the board. So um, this is EI tilde, okay? Um, then T EI plus one, actually I said I would, would write the tilde. And then finally um, T EI inverse. Sorry, this one should be T uh, because it lives between, see, this last arc also lives between floor one and floor two, right? Except it's going down. Okay, so they live, they live between the same floors. So this one also gets labeled by T. Again, the, the second bit of this is going from floor one to floor two, whereas the other one is going from floor two to floor one. Therefore, they they have the same weight. The label of which floor they live on should be the same, and we're choosing to call this T. So again, think of this as a, a kind of counting the T here that just distinguishes one loop, one arc from a translation of this arc on a different floor. Look, why is not yes. this square, this square, the last one? Why is not? Yeah, so square? that's that's what I was trying to explain. So the T is labeling in a way which between which copies is this arc living, right? So the first arc goes from the zeroth floor to the first floor. Yes. And so we, we don't put a power in front of it. Uh, okay, okay. The second arc goes from the first floor to the second floor. Uh, yes, okay. So it lives between the first and second uh, floor. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Right? And the Whereas other the one, other one is back. just the same, but reverse. Okay, okay, okay. So it still lives between the first and second floor, if you will. Okay. It is, it is a citizen of the staircase. Okay. It, I guess it makes sense to think of the staircase, right? The okay. T is telling you which staircase you're taking. Okay, okay. great. I, I think maybe that's the right way to, to look at it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, the pictures in my notes are a little clearer, maybe. Um, it, it, should be, it should be in the notes that I... Out there is a question. Uh, sure. You cannot deform this resulting path to the one given just by one AJ action, if I may put it like that. Can you? Uh, you have to, you're fixing the endpoints of each arc. Is that, I don't know if that helps answer the question. I, it's not my question. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so no, I mean, you're, you're, the endpoints, the, the homotopy that you're using to deform loops fixes the endpoints on each floor. So, so you, you cannot like translate one into another or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, okay. So, okay it's because uh, I was thinking about like deforming the path, but on the... Um, covering space. 
It's like uh, it looks like uh, it's this join on on the on the, on the three figures. But like if we if we go up to the covenant space, it should be a continuous path as as you said. I'm just curious to see to, to know whether you could deform this continuous path on the uh, covenant space to the one that which is you know be given by the E1, but yeah. this by yeah by the E1 action. But apparently not because you're fixing the, the the points in each x0 yes. t2 tx t, tx0 t2 x0 exactly that's right yeah okay that's right that all sense. those are yeah all right Thank i you. mean technically you don't have to fix the intermediate points i guess but i'm definitely fixing the end points of each mm -hmm. one. yeah okay all right thank you sure Okay, so why did I do go through all this? Well, I told you that this is a slightly richer action, right? In the sense that there's a bit more stuff going on here. We're recording these copies somehow. And so what we're going to do now is to abelianize this action. So this is still not abelian, right? These, again, there's a family of loops now, the M, the I, and TN, remember that TN labels the staircase that the loop is using, right? So these are, sorry, I keep saying loops, but these are arcs. So TN labels which arc it is, but especially which staircase. Um, so, so this is a much larger number of arcs than there were loops to begin with. It's potentially an infinite number of arcs, right? So, and by the way, if I act on TEI, it's pretty obvious that I just multiply everything by T, right? Because you're just shifting all of the copies by one. Right? And similarly with T inverse or something like this. So we know how to do this action for any of these arcs. Okay. So now let me let me abelianize this. So let me treat everything as being commutative. But remember that TEI and TEI inverse. So this is the loop TEI plus one, and this is the loop TEI. Okay, all inverted. Might make more sense to put the inverse outside. Of it. Yeah, maybe that makes more sense. Okay, so now I abelianize this. So if I abelianize it, and again, I'm being very casual because, of course, you need to usually use different notation to indicate what you've done, right? So let me just use the capital letters again to indicate the abelian version of this. So again, there's an EI. There's a T E I plus one, and then there's a T E I. Okay. So perhaps you've caught the difference here. At this point, T is just some symbol, right? It's a way of keeping track of loops. But in particular, I could treat T as being just a number, right? In the sense that all I need is some way of counting by taking powers. So in fact, a convenient thing is to take T to be a, uh, some number on the unit circle, a complex number on the unit circle, okay? Because powers of that number will give me some new number. And even, in fact, if I pick alpha to not be a rational multiple of pi, then I can have an infinite number of copies because taking powers will negatively never give me the same complex number. So perhaps you've seen now what the difference is from what I did before when we abelianized the action on pi one. The magic here is that this and this do not cancel, even though the thing is commutative, because EI is not the same arc as TEI. They live on different floors of the house or different staircases. Again, I think maybe it's better to think of the staircases once I'm thinking that. So that is the insight here, is that I've abelianized a slightly richer covering space rather than the original space. And I have sort of prevented a cancellation that was happening on the base space. And in fact, as I said, because I can think of T as a complex number, why not, right? I just didn't tell you anything about this symbol. Then I can rewrite this as one minus T 
times the i plus t the i plus one. This has a first an obvious interpretation. If I set t equal to one, then I'm back to the abelian piece, right? Because t equals to one is just no covering space. Because if I set t equals to one, that means every copy is the same. And so if I set t equal to one, I just re recover the symmetric group again, and nothing good has happened. But for any other choice of t, something has happened, right? So I, have, I have a different action than I did before. And in fact, the promise of what I told you would happen sort of has happened here is that this is now a linear action. EI is some uh, element of this vector space now. And my sigma i star is acting on it linearly, which is giving me some linear combination of the elements of the vector space. So everything is matrices. Okay. So in fact, we can think of this as a linear representation of the Bray group, which I guess I will write with square brackets. The square bracket sigma i means the representation of sigma i using this construction as a matrix acting on this abelianized covering space. So what does the matrix look like? Well, it's a big matrix. Um, but remember that it leaves most of the EIs alone, right? So this matrix has a lot of ones on the diagonal. Most basis elements are untouched by this, except for one little block um, in the middle, which looks something like this. There's a one minus t, a t, a one, and a zero. So there's a kind of two by two block corresponding to the one minus t and the t. So this is one minus t times ei plus t times ei plus one. Let me just draw. basis vectors here. So in other words, this should be acting on a column vector consisting of loops, E1 to En, or sorry, arcs, right? And here is EI, and here is EI across one. So it gives you exactly what I said it does, right? EI is one minus, the image of EI is one minus T times EI plus T times EI plus one. And similarly, the image of EI plus one is EI, because that doesn't change from what it was before when it abelianized. So this is a matrix representation or a linear representation of the break group BN, the break group acting on the disk with N punctures. What is, what is often called a homological representation because it arises from this construction using homology groups and covering spaces. There's some dot dot dots here, right? And finally, there's a name for this representation. This is called the Birao representation. B U R A U is the Mr. Burau who first made this construction, probably somewhere in the 1920s, I want to say, 1910s, so about 100 years ago. Okay. Any questions so far? No, there is. Uh, yes. Uh... Oh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I I I see why why this is a rich structure from the from the abelianized case, 
but I don't see why this is a simpler a structure for the 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 original one, the the free group, when we have the exponential graph of the of the words. Yes, it is not a very because simpler th that right now. Like, like an inter yeah. mm -hmm. That is to so, be in the intermediate place, yeah. Yeah. So the difference is that I know how to calculate growth now of matrices in the sense that what happens if I keep acting with a set of matrices on some initial set of loops? The asymptotic growth of repeating some repeated action of some set of generators of some braid on some loops can now be entirely figured out by using linear algebra, so using eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In other words, I can directly tell you how fast this grows by just computing the leading eigenvalue of this matrix. Whereas with the free group representation, there is no easy way to compute what the growth rate would be. There is no known characteristic polynomial or something like that that you can compute. There are ways, and I'll maybe say something a bit more at the end, there are ways to actually do it using the free group approach as well. But this is very fast and expedient. You give me a break, I can immediately convert it to a matrix, and I just compute the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, and I'm done. I haven't quite told you why the largest eigenvalue is what you want, but I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. But does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, yes. So uh, we we already have the, the exponential growth, but now we are capable to determine the direction and the rate and use exactly. Okay. Exactly. And, and trust me when I say that this is extremely hard to do with symbolic dynamics on a free group. It is, it is very, very tedious to try to compute yeah, any see. kind of growth at all. It's good, you know, if you don't believe me, it's a good idea to try to do some mathematical, for instance, right? Try to define <laughs> an action on a free group and try to tell me the growth rate of the number of symbols, um, you know, to five significant digits using Mathematica. And uh, I'm not sure that you can, you'll be able to do that. It's, a, it's a, okay. Okay. I see. computationally quite challenging. Yeah. Whereas finding eigenvalues of matrices is now. Okay. Yeah, I see now. Thank you. Yeah. So linear algebra is our friend, right? That was kind of my point before is that we kind of know how to do everything once you turn something into linear algebra. Okay. But why is it that this works? And again, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be able to justify this properly, but let me just say, roughly speaking, what happens, right? If I have a, let's say I have a sequence of, right? Something, some large word, again, we call them braid words, right? So a sequence of generators, but this defines a braid. The dilatation, remember we had the symbol lambda, which was the, stretch factor or dil dil the dilatation of a mapping class. It turns out that the dilatation of the mapping class is bounded below by the spectral radius of the Bureau representation of my brain. So the spectral radius is the largest eigenvalue in magnitude. Okay. Um, so you just compute the eigenvalues of your matrix, but you pick the largest one, again, in absolute value. So it could be negative or it could be complex, but you take the biggest one in magnitude. That's called the spectral radius. But there's one last thing. It is actually the supremum over all t's with magnitude one. So over all t's in the unit circle, on the unit circle. Well, it's true for any T with magnitude one, okay? Um, so why is there this restriction to magnitude one? Well, you know, your, your T's here are gonna enter some big powers, right? When you, once you start multiplying this matrix over and over again, these parameter T's are gonna enter the expression with some very large powers eventually. And if T is 20, then these large powers will dominate everything. Okay. So that's why we put this limit that the modulus of T should be exactly equal to one 
And by the way, the same thing goes if T is small, because then there'll be negative powers in some places, because the inverse of this involves negative powers of T. And so then you would get growth because of this, the, neg the, the, the negative powers of some small numbers. So the compromise is to say, we're going to assume that the magnitude of T is exactly one. So that way T, T to the plus or minus M is always on the unit circle anyways. What that means is that the growth comes from the number of symbols in a way, right? So it, it is not the parameter itself, which is growing. It's that the parameter is doing its job and is keeping track of the number of symbols in a reasonable way. But when I say in a reasonable way, that's why there's a bigger than or equal here. It's because we don't actually know for sure that we're capturing exactly the number of symbols in the free group. We have lost some information. The homology group, I told you that one and T didn't cancel, right? And that's fine, but what if, you, what if some arc happens to go up and then back down? So then, then there could be a cancellation that there wouldn't be at the fundamental group level. So there are still some cancellations in this, um, in the growth of these arcs, which is not necessarily happening at the level of the fundamental group. And that's why we get a greater than or equal. There is a way to justify this, of course, rigorously. Um, this is basically due to you know, work of free uh, in the early 80s. There's also a nice paper by Kolev um, who basically proved this bound. And all of this is kind of based on the work of earlier work in the 70s of Manning and, and Bowen. Basically, Manning proved a homological bound on the topological entropy, which is essentially like this lambda. And Bowen kind of extended this to the fundamental group. Right? These are all things that are considered very natural and, and intuitive now, but it was originally explored and proved in the 70s. And then Friedman Kolev uh, played with the Burau representation directly, or just especially free more general types of representations of groups. So this is an interesting supremum because you don't really know where the best, you know, what is the best choice of the parameter T. In fact, there's an obvious choice which often works, and that's T equals minus one. So then this becomes two, one, one, right? This is the double cover, meaning when T is equal to minus one, then T squared is immediately equal to one. And so therefore you only have two copies of your original space. So there is a theorem um, due to, um, um, Boylan and Harrington, that if this is equality, then it must be for t equals minus one. So you get equality here if and only if t is equal to minus one. And there's some deep things here. It turns out that the equality can only arise when um, the covering space is actually what's called the orientation double cover, meaning your mapping is exactly of the right kind that you can branch at these cuts that I, that I put earlier, but my staircases are exactly of the right form that what I've actually constructed is the so-called orientation double cover uh, for this space. And that actually depends on the map. So you cannot predict in advance without knowing more information, what is the optimal T that you should use here to get the best bound possible, but, it, but very often T equals minus one is the correct one. And in particular, you will get equality. But of course, you don't know that you have equality unless you use other means. So it doesn't help. So this is what is often called the Burau bound on the topological entropy of a braid or on the dilatation of a braid. Okay? It's something that's extremely easy to compute because it's just very rapid linear algebra. Right? You give me a sequence of generators. I convert them to matrices one by one using this construction. I carry out the matrix product, and then I compute the largest eigenvalue of this. In particular, for three punctures, if I only have, if I'm working on B3, 
the break group with three punctures, then this is exact. It always works. Okay. Meaning I, I pick equals minus one, and then this is always equality. But that's really an artifact of the fact that the torus is so simple. So it goes back to the construction that we did a few weeks ago, showing how the torus can be projected down to the disc, et cetera, et cetera, using the double covering construction. Okay. So um, it's not surprising that for t equals minus one on B3, for the break group with three strings, that everything just works automatically. The interest, of course, is what happens when you have more, um, more strands. So this is what I would call a very cheap bound, meaning it's very easy to compute. And sometimes it gives good results, but you don't really know what the gap is. There's a very nice paper by uh, Melissa Young um, and other people at Caltech, where they use the Buran representation actually for a kind of data analysis application on very large braids. So if I give you a humongous braid, can you extract some topological information from the Bureau representation matrix itself? And it turns out that by looking at the eigenvectors of these matrices, uh, Young and co-authors were able to say something about the coherence of the brain in some sense. Like, are there parts of the brain that are twisted together, but not with other parts? And that turns out to be a very effective tool for, uh, for a kind of simple data analysis of trajectories. So what else can you do, right? What are the other methods of computing this lambda? In, in a way, that's kind of what I'm after here, is give me a very large braid, and how can I compute this growth factor? And I'll just mention two other methods. There's an approach which is due to um, Vesvina and Handel, in the 1980s, which is basically an approach using something called train tracks. Train tracks is a kind of graphical a graph theoretic approach when faced with a, a so-called automorphism of a free group. So in other words, some action on the free group like we defined before, I told you that the difficulty is that we don't really know how to deal that using with linear algebra, right? That was the question I was asked just earlier. So let's say I have some action, right, on the free group with N generators, some mapping, it's called an endomorphism, is acting on the gen on the generators of this group. And I would like to know under repeated iteration, what is this mapping like? Not just the growth factor, but also maybe some properties such as whether it can be decomposed into multiple pieces, et cetera. Um, and Vesvina and Handel came up with an algorithm which allows you to essentially linearize the problem, but not for free. You have to build a graph for the way that your mapping is acting on these generators. And then you correct this graph as you go along using some well-defined algorithm in a way that you can eventually show that there can never be any kind of cancellations between your generators in any future iterates. And once you've done that, you've basically proved that you can write down the problem as a linear algebra problem. In their approach, you basically get eventually a large matrix of non-negative entries and the largest eigenvalue of this matrix will give you exactly the growth rate of the map. In that case, everything is exact, meaning that they don't get a lower bound, they get an exact value for this growth. Um, so you might ask, why did I tell you about this? Well, it's a very complicated algorithm and it's much slower. It doesn't scale very well with the size of the brain and with the number of strands. So um, Toby Hall has a wonderful uh, implementation of this algorithm in C++. But I mean, it's years of his life writing this code, right? In the sense that he wrote this um, a while back, and I use this code a lot, but 
this is a serious piece of computation to actually carry out the Besvina Handel algorithm on a given braid. It's, it's, it's a challenge. It is far harder to do than this simple linear algebra brown bound. So that's one option. I would call this the sort of the best solution from a mathematical standpoint, but also uh, a less than ideal solution from the point of view of practical applications again because it doesn't scale very well to very large braids, which you might be interested for some data analysis purpose. Perhaps you have a large number of trajectories, like maybe a million trajectories from some identical system, and you would like to compute the properties of this brain, the Besvina Handel algorithm would be hard to implement for a million strands. It would probably not stop, it would, it would go on forever. So there's a different approach which uses what's called Dinikov coordinates. So Dinikov coordinates is a clever way of making coordinates for loops on the disk. So the idea is that if I give you a disk and I draw an arbitrary closed curve, so remember, I introduced the idea of an essential curve in the first lecture. So that's the curve that is not contractible to a point. So let's say I draw some curve on the disk. Dinikov coordinates is a nice way of reconstructing a two-dimensional equivalence class of a curve by looking at intersections of this curve with some reference lines i.e. a triangulation of the curve of this space. So I could do something like this. I would put some cuts, which look a little bit like my branch cuts, but they're not really my branch cuts. And maybe I would put some extra cuts, like one in between or something. And Dinikov coordinate tells me that if I count how many crossings along each of these curves, I think I need a couple more. Then I can reconstruct the closed curve uniquely, actually the equivalence class of the curve, right? So because I'm allowed to deform the curve, but I'm going to deform the curve such that it has a minimum number of crossing with any of these reference curves. So this only works for two-dimensional curves, of course, because you know if I draw a curve in three dimensions, it, it's topologically not very constrained, right? It can do a lot of things. But in two dimensions, if you try to draw a curve that does not intersect itself, it's extremely constrained. And that's what Dinikov coordinates basically exploits is the fact that if I give you just a number of crossings, I don't give you the curve, then you can reconstruct the curve fairly easily. So that's the first step of why Dinikov coordinates are useful. But the second step is that there's an action of the break group directly on Dinikov coordinates. So I don't even have to draw the curve anymore. I could just directly modify the curve according to elements of the gray group and predict what the new curve would look like. In other words, the, the, the action of the gray group acts directly on the crossing numbers. It's even more clever than that because it involves actually differences of the crossings, but I won't get into that. And the point is that you get what's called a piecewise linear action. And it's extremely, it's extremely easy to compute the growth of curves using this action because it is somewhere in between linear algebra and, well, it's piecewise linear in the sense that the Nikov coordinates are almost like matrices acting on this curve, but exactly which matrix depends on the curve itself. So it's not quite linear algebra, but it's also not a free group in the sense that there's not, nothing combinatorial that's hard to compute. So you cannot use the Nikov coordinates to get a nice um, eigenvalue, not by, in the sense of a matrix eigenvalue, but you can't iterate on a curve and just follow the growth rate of a, of a curve very precisely. So I have a software package called BraidLab, which computes the growth, the, you know, the expansion constant for large braids, and BraidLab uses the Nikov coordinates to do this because it is by far the most efficient way of doing it. You can also do Visvini Handel and you can also do Bureau, but the reference way of doing it is, is the Nikov coordinates. It's an extremely efficient way of computing with braids. It allows you also to decide whether two braids are equal 
by just acting on the two curves with two braids and seeing if you get the same result. So Dinei Kav coordinates solve a lot of difficult algebraic problems in a geometric fashion. So they're very, very useful. Okay, I think I've reached a good stopping point. As I hinted here at the end, there's lots of other aspects to this. Um, I'm just gonna plug my little book that's gonna come out this summer. If you're interested in this, I'm gonna, Springer is publishing a book called Braids and Dynamics, which is a very short book. It's like hundred and something pages on all this stuff. Lots of pictures, lots of explanations. The notes that I gave you at the beginning are kind of the seed for these, the, the, this book that's coming up. So if you're at all interested, uh, I invite you to check it out when it comes out. And I think in July or August is when the book is coming out. Okay, I guess that's it. And I'll take questions now if there are any. Okay, Thanks. so first, let's thank you for the great lectures, very inspiring. So please, everyone join me to just thank Jean-Luc. Thank you. And um, any more question? People, we, we are looking for, to, for your book, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and um, I hope it won't be yes, expensive. I, it shouldn't be expensive. I hope it's not going to be expensive. I apologize if it turns out to be very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> there is a question. There is a question from Bra Bra yes, Bra uh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Professor, for the course. Uh, very good. Okay. Uh, and finally, I, I want to, to do two questions. Uh, one is in summary, you say that in the case, the, the motivation a case that the three rods, uh, you say that the optimal T uh, is minus one. Uh, that means that uh, the optimal way of steering these rods is a counterwise rotation, isn't it? Uh, no, I think you're kind of, there's two ideas that you're, that you're conflating here. On the one hand, there's the optimal way of choosing this braid. And the other hand, there's the optimal way of computing the growth of, of, of the braid. And the t equals minus one is about computing the growth. It's not a mechanical thing. It's just a mathematical thing. Whereas the choice of braid is very much has to do with what exactly what motion are you going to do in this disc. But what I'm saying is that given this motion, if I want to compute using this linear algebra approach using the Birao, uh, representation, I will get exactly the correct answer if I use t equals minus one. But that's a mathematical thing. There's no physical meaning to t, right? whereas there's okay. very much a physical meaning to the brain. Okay. I, I, I... Does that make sense? Okay, it was miss. Yeah, yeah, made sense. Thank you. And the last one is uh, in the in the notes. There is the reference for the for the paper that talks about the data analysis on the coherence and. This one that you cite from the Caltech. Oh, from Caltech? From the, the paper that I mentioned yeah, yeah. by Young. I, I, Young I, I was, I, yeah. It's, yeah, it's too yeah. recent. I think it only yeah. came out, it came out yeah. after I wrote those notes. I, it's in the journal Chaos, maybe in 2020 or so. Journal Chaos. Yeah, so it's Young. Um, okay. And, Y-E-U-N-G-E-L-O-M uh, Chaos, the journal Chaos. Uh, and I want to say 2019. Yeah, I have not updated these notes with these new references, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, there's also a paper where oh, I do the same thing with Michael so. Allshouse, but we use a different method, which I think is kind of more challenging. Um, so. I very much like their approach. Yeah. Yeah, it's young, like I think it's Dibon. Uh, thank you so much. It'll be cited in the book. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Question? Yes. No? 
So, Jean-Luc, thank, thank you once more for this wonderful gift that you gave us. And, thank uh, you. I'll, I'll count at you for, for more specific uh, question about some small project that we thought about. Okay. 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 Sounds great. Thank you. Say hello to everyone there. To Hadris. Say hello to Hadris to start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. I enjoyed it Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you to you. It was great. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor.